欢迎大家。I am Shenzhen Liao, Director of Education at China Institute. It's seven o'clock in the evening now in New York. I know we have uh, everyone from everywhere almost. It's, it's really great uh, to be able to um, have you join this program. Uh, it's still in the middle of the uh, Spring Festival. So wish you a very happy and healthy Year of the Tiger. 祝大家虎年吉祥如意,阖家安康. Today's topic, Golden Blossoms, looking into China's exclusive poetic couplets, we specifically created for today as a little bit more depth to understand the cultural and the literary tradition related to Chinese New Year. I was a language teacher in school and is still teaching at China Institute. I know I have a lot to learn about Chinese language and culture in general myself. But when I started taking Mr. Ben Wang's courses on classical literature, I realized so much is missing in my own education of Chinese poetry itself. The connections between image, song, and meanings that Chinese characters integrate together and the intricate rules that Chinese poetry have developed to make those lines. Many of you perhaps remember by Li Bai or Du Fu or many other great poets more than 1000 years ago, still memorable today. So much that of course, we cannot cover them all today, but I'm very excited to be able to invite you to this workshop to have a peek of this world. And thank you for joining us. And at this moment, I would uh, ask you, please re request you, please mute yourself. We have a lot of people in the Zoom. I just want to um, make sure we have an uninterrupted experience. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. Ben Wang, please let me first Turn to Professor Frank Tang, leading developed Chinese language teacher at New York University, our long term, long time partner of professional development for many years. Many of you may have heard me repeating this for too many times, but it's truly, truly an honor and pleasure to have been working with you and Professor Robin Harvey. I know you are here in the Zoom and many teachers from DCLT project. So please, Professor Tang, can you say a few words? Thank you, Chen Jian. It's, it's never going to be too many for our collaborations. And we are looking forward to more collaboration after this one about the next one is the whole series about Chinese art, poetry, and which you're gonna talk about. Again, Xin Nian Kuai Le, 大家身体好,开心,快乐,如意 uh, uh, And I just wish everybody a very happy uh, Lunar Chinese New Year uh, with happiness, good health, and safety. And I just want to mention one other thing that we are going to collaborate on another activity uh, that is the creativity in language learning. So if you are interested in language learning. Uh, that is the one that we are going to run on February the 25th. Uh, it's also a Friday at 7.30. And we're talking about how to use visuals in language teaching. And by Dr. Amy Young from the cold, cold Minneapolis. But the talk will be very heartwarming. So you're all welcome to join us. Um, Again, welcome everyone. And I turn uh, the uh, forum to back to Shenzhen. Thank you, Tang Lao Shi. Uh, speaking of uh, partnership, our uh, next series uh, in spring, starting March 2nd, we're also collaborating with Tang Lao Shi and Robin and DCLT. Uh, it's a series on art, ritual, and religion. Uh, this is a sixth session series designed for K-12 educators uh, teaching about China and the Chinese language. So it's actually for all different subjects and uh, all grade levels. 
Uh, but it's truly fascinating to start from art objects from over 3,000 years ago, looking into um, how we are dealing with life and death, uh, what we can learn from ancient Chinese civilizations, and how we bring this to K-12 classrooms. It's also welcoming general public audience. So if you are interested in this fascinating topics, please go to our website. Uh, I, I would ask my colleague Yongqiang Lin, Lin Lao Shi, to have the link in the chat box so that you can easily access. Uh, our next one also working together with DCLT is the Teaching Chinese in Challenging Times. That's on May 7th. Uh, now we are calling for papers. Uh, this is the 20th New York International Conference on Teaching Chinese. It has a long tradition and a welcome Chinese language teachers and beyond to join this conference, to have a discussion, to connect and reconnect in this field. So before I still have one more announcement, this workshop tonight is um, also designed for teachers in New York State to have CTLE credits. Uh, please, if you are interested getting the certificate for two hour CTLE, please stay and complete the survey at the end of the workshop. Keep in mind, you need to stay through the entire workshop in order to be eligible for the certificate. All right, with that policing message, I will turn to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. Ben Wang. Mr. Ben Wang, well, he has a long, um, it, it's a lot for me to say, but I know I want to save more time for him to speak. Uh, Mr. Wang, a senior lecturer in language and humanities at China Institute, a published writer on classical Chinese poetry, drama, and many other topics an award-winning translator, both from Chinese into English and vice versa, and a true ambassador of Chinese culture to the Western world, lecturing extensively at universities, museums, and cultural institutions, including New York University, Columbia, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Lincoln Center, just to name a few, the list can go on and on. This is very significant. I'm excited about tonight's topic, also because it is derived from discussions of a calligraphy piece after of Mr. Wang's personal collection. So I can hear some background. Uh, please mute and, yourself, one person, please. One yeah, participant. Someone is just shut down their production. Chen, Chen, Pei Chen. Thank okay, you, good. thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, without further ado, please let me turn to Mr. Wang. Wang Lao Shi, it's all yours. Thank you. Director Sun Zhan, Professor Tang. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Sun Zhan, which I'm not too sure if I deserve. Well, tonight we're here to study the work of a great artist. In celebrating great artists and their works, we elevate ourselves. So tonight I feel indeed very elevated in talking about one of my personal favorite artists who are at once one of the greatest poets, calligraphers and painters in the history of Chinese art. And his name is Hu Ru, and he is the great grandson of the sixth emperor 
of the Qin Dynasty, the last dynasty ruled by the Manchus. Uh, about his background, I think you have read a very brief, uh, his bio on the announcement that was sent to you by China Institute. So I will not spend more time because as it is, my time is very limited. This is my problem. I always have, I always have problems with the limited time. To talk about this couplet, I could well spend three or four hours doing it. But alas, I'm given only an hour and a half to do it. So I will, I will try my best. Now, let's delve immediately into the study or a close look of this great piece of poetic couplet. The history of the poetic couplet is very long, actually. It started with Chinese poetry. Uh, in the title, in the title of Book of Songs, uh, in which there consists of 305 poems collected by Confucius. And those were mostly quatrosyllabic poems. So that was, those songs were sung and created by the Chinese farmers. Maybe around 2000 BC, but not until the 10th century uh, emerged, there emerged a poet emperor in China during the five dynasties period. He decided to take two lines from a heptasyllabic or pentasyllabic regulated verse to call it a couplet. So this is the beginning of the poetic couplet, but poetry started 200 BC around that time, but not until 1000 AD was this couplet presented to the world. And when do the Chinese use these couplets? At celebration or funeral service, meaning the most important times. And the Chinese would dis have them displayed at funeral service for all the people who go to the service to look at them. But as for all the couplets for celebrations, the Chinese would hand them on either side of the, of the front door from the poorest masses to all the uh, members of the arist ar aristocrats, members of the aristocracy. So this is a general practice, especially during the Lunar New Year's time. So this poem, the poem we're going to study is one of the uh, couplets written, composed and written by this great artist at Luna New Year's time. Uh, so before we look at the couplet in, China, in the Chinese language, I would like to introduce to you the grammatical uh, construction of a couplet. What is a couplet? So 
maybe we should look at what I have prepared for you, the, the, the grammatical structure, structure of this literary genre. So Lila, shall we take a look? Yes. Uh, the part about the construction, about the structure, yes. So let's examine the couplet's grammatical parallelism. That's what I call it. So since this is a heptasyllabic couplet, which means there are seven characters per line and there are two lines. And before I go move on, I must remind you or tell you for those who have not been exposed to the study of the Chinese language. The Chinese language is a monosyllabic language, the spoken Chinese. Every character, every symbol, you may call it a Chinese word, but we call it Chinese characters. Every Chinese character has only one syllable. That's why we call it, I call it a monosyllabic language. So if I say it's a heptasyllabic poetry, that means each line would consist of seven characters, seven syllables. So hepta is seven. So heptasyllabic, that means seven characters, seven syllables per line. So the first line, there are only two lines. The first line, the structure, as how it's the perfect structure of a couplet is as how it shows on the paper, on the screen now, under couplets grammatical parallelism. From the word parallelism that I chose to use, it's not hard for you to figure out that the, each character of the line must be parallel to the same character at the same spot in the second line. So let's look at it. So in this uh, couplet, which is perfect in its grammatical structure, as well as in its to tonal structure, tonal scheme. But let's look at the grammatical structure first. So parallelism is the key word to govern this genre, poetic genre. So this is how it goes. In the first line, we have a noun followed by a noun. In between, there is an, an omitted adjective particle. And then followed by another omitted adjective particle, OAP. And followed by another noun. In other words, we have an adjective and a noun followed by another adjective and noun. But those, these two adjectives are originally noun. We all know nouns can function as adjectives. So we have a noun followed by another noun, followed by another noun and followed by another omitted adjective particle, which is followed by yet another noun. So we have four nouns together and three of them, they have omitted adjectival particles before them. And the double slash, that means the second part of the first line. So the First four characters make up the first part of this line, of the first line of the 
uh, couplet. And now we move to the final three characters in the first line. And another noun followed by an omitted adge adjective and part, it's an adjectival particle followed by another noun. And then the predicate of this, of this first line of the entire line shows up at the, at the very end. So I put a note in there. The omitted particle is the, this character, or zhi, Z-H-I, in sound. The is more vernacular, colloquial, and zhi, the second one, is more classical. So before I move on, I need very quickly to explain to you why it is that the Chinese will not allow any adjective or modification to go after the noun. It must precede the noun. To the Chinese, we see the superficial and the outlook first. Then we get up, go move on to see the real thing that is being described. In other words, a phrase in English such as mission impossible, that word order is impossible to the Chinese readers because we have to say impossible mission. Class, are you with me? So when you, in English, when you say the girl pretty is a girl I like, you can never ever say put the pretty after the girl. And can, you can never ever put it, I like after the girl as in English. In English, you can say a girl pretty is a girl I like. In Chinese, you have to say a pretty girl equals to I like that kind of girl. Class, did you hear me clearly? Have I made have I made myself quite clear? Because this will turn out as one of the grammatical nemeses to students who study Chinese, because you have been poisoned by the English, French, Italian, Spanish, or the Western languages, because you love to put adjectives, particularly in French and in Spanish, but in Chinese, we don't allow that. So modification adjectives must forever and ever precede the nouns that they describe. So the first line, the structure of the line is now, this now with the following particle, this now has been turned into an adjective followed by a noun and followed by another omitted particle, which shows that it is an adjective, followed by yet another noun, followed by yet another omitted adjectival particle, followed by yet another noun. In other words, the first four character phrase of the first line is now, 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 just that, three of the four nouns, I mean, two of the, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, three of the four nouns have modifications, have adjectives before them, followed by the final three characters. That's how you read this line. The first four characters would be grouped to together when you chant it or when you recite it. And the last three characters put together, it is now followed by an omitted adjectival particle, followed by another noun. Then the verb, the predicate appears. Class, 
I hope I haven't lost you. So the, this is called a couplet. And in Chinese, it is called a parallel, parallel couplet, which means in the second line, the grammatical construction or structure, grammatical structure of the second line must be exactly the same as the first line, which is now followed by omitted adjectival particle and followed by a noun followed by another omitted modification and particle and another noun, followed by yet another omitted modification and particle, followed by the noun it describes, it modifies. And the, and the last three characters must be grouped together when you recite, recite the phrase in which you have a noun followed by another omitted adjectival particle followed by a noun, and then the verb comes out. Class, is it quite clear? Okay, now let's move on to the second most important thing, which has a lot to do with grammar, as reflected in the pictures. Now we have to talk about the musical aspect of these two lines. Because after all, you may know that China, the Chinese language is a most unique blending of music and fine art in that spoken Chinese is based on music and written Chinese is based on pictographs, fine art. That's why all languages in the world are interesting, but for a, for a true uniqueness, the Chinese language is non pareil because it's an eerie combination of music, and painting, music, and fine art. So now we must first study the, the tonal scheme of the couplet. Lin Lao may we go up a little bit? We'll, no, no, go up. We'll study the tonal scheme, the tones. So the tonal scheme of a couplet works out this way. Of the five tones of the classical Chinese language, two of them are high pitch. Actually, the word tone in the Chinese language is nothing but pitch in the English language. You do it high pitch, but everything is, it is, uh, ruled, everything is uh, stipulated and it, you cannot go against the tone, the pitch of the picture of the character that the Chinese people created thousands of years ago. So there is a set tone or pitch to every character that you see. And there are five tones, meaning five pitches to the classical Chinese language. Two of them are high, are in high pitch, and three of them are in low pitch. High tones are called ping, ping, P-I-N-G, rising, ping, rising into the sky in Chinese. And the low tones, and the low pitch, low pitched tones in Chinese, they are called zi, zi. So ping and zi. So ping represents high tones. Zi re represents the low tones. So the tonal scheme 
of this couplet, of a perfect couplet, is as follows. When I say a perfect couplet is what we are going to study today. So the tonal scheme in Chinese, we would chant after, after we are, after we have appreciated a poem or after we have composed a, a, a couplet or a poem in the classical Chinese language. So in the case of a heptasyllabic poem, so this couplet, the tonal scheme in Chinese would be, we would chant ping ping zhe zhe, ping ping zhe. And the second line would be the entire and antithetical to the first line. It would be zhe zhe ping ping, zhe zhe ping. Class, if you hear me do this ping, you know I'm rising and I try to reach for heaven. And when I do zhe, it's falling down, falling and to reach the earth. So all the ping toned characters are to the Chinese characters, pictures that should logically belong in the masculine force dominated universe. So sky is the limit. So that's heavenly pitch. That's why they are high and they are reaching for the high. And the zhe is earth. We have heaven and earth. It's an earthly tone, earthly pitch. That's why zhe is falling. So it, let me chant one more time and for you to hear the tones. Ping, ping, zhe, zhe. Ping, ping, zhe. Zhe, zhe, ping, ping. Zhe, zhe, ping. So this is how a perfect uh, couplet in classical Chinese based on poetry actually is taken out of a long, long poem of five lines or seven lines. So the Chinese now call it a couplet. So there's a celebratory couplet. There is a funereal, elegiac uh, per, uh, uh, couplet. So tonight to celebrate the Lunar Chinese New Year, we have 15 days to celebrate the Lunar Chinese New Year in China. So today is the 11th, 11th day of the new year, of the first lunar month. So we still have four more days to go. So today we study this couplet of celebration. Now let's see whether or not the couplet, which I claim, I tell you, it's so perfect. Let's see whether or not the grammatical, the structural scheme and tonal scheme, whether or not these two schemes would fit the couplet we're going to study. And the rules are so strict, but the lines, but the couplet and the poem must read and and be read completely in a natural sound. So everyone who reads these two lines, who look at these two lines, would think it's so natural. Yes. Yet it's not without a very careful study, maybe hours of study, to make it perfect. But our poet, Puro, 
I saw him because he wrote this couplet in my house. I was 14 years old. And I, I watched him sit there for about 10 seconds before he rose and he approached the paper and the ink, ink patty that my parents had the servants uh, ready for him to, to put down these two lines. So it took him a few seconds to think of these two lines to dedicate this uh, couplet to my parents. Now let's look at th these two lines. The first line, it starts with a character, Jing. And the first character of the first line, it means gold. But if it means gold, it's a picture. It's not English, it's not French, it's not Spanish, it's not Russian, it's Chinese. Chinese language is based on picture, it's a it's an entirely visceral language. It's not a cerebral language. So every picture is, every character is a picture based on fine art. It's a pictograph. So this character is gold, but it can be golden. And the second character, the top of the character, the, the top component of the second character is grass. Meaning, if you see this component in a Chinese character, you know the radical, which means the root of the character must have something to do with plants, flowers, or vegetation, or woods, or plants, so the second character of the first line, the bottom component means transform. So grass going through trans transformation because it was born a piece of grass and it grows and grows all of a sudden on the tip of this grass, the leaves transformed into the stalk would coming out of the stalk would be a flower, first a bud, then it would bloom. So this character is grass transformed, transformed into a blossom, a flower. So this is the Chinese character for flower or blossom. So the first two characters together, Jin is the adjective modification. Hua is the blossom. So you see in between Jin and Hua, there is an omitted adjectival particle. In classical Chinese, that particle loves to be omitted. And here it is. So Jin Hua is golden blossoms golden flowers, golden petals. So to translate a Chinese poem from Chinese into English is a real challenge because there are so many ways you can translate it. But if you want to translate it into a, in, an English poem, you can't spend, you can't put down too many, too many English words because, because after all, in Chinese, in the original, there are only seven characters. So either you do an annotation of this line, or if you translate it into English, you have to use one of the many English words that you think is the most precise, appropriate, or concise to translate it. So let's move on to the third character. First, we have golden blossoms. Where? And what does it mean, golden blossoms? Does that mean that in ancient times, the blossoms 
some blossoms were made of gold? Not at all. It just say looks golden. It looks go like gold. It's not necessarily real gold. The third character, the left hand side shows you the sun is shining on the capital or on a major metropolis. The top component of the left hand side component, the top component of the left hand side component of the third character happens to be the sun. The sun is shining on the capital or a major metropolis. That's the left hand side component. The right hand side, you see the three downward strokes. Class, what is, if I don't tell you what the these three stroke strokes put together as the right hand side component as one component, what is your wild get, wild guess? What do you think it is? Even though I'm the lecturer, but <laughs> I'm entitled to ask you a question. So class, can anyone volunteer an answer? Demute and let me hear your answer. Please. Shadow? The, who said that? Lori, me. Lori, I love you, Lori. <laughs> I love you deeply. Why the rest of you, why can't the rest of you be more like Lori. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> shadow, shadow as well as echoes sounds in three pieces. So three, the, these strokes, they represent reflections or shadow or the echo, echoing sound in the Chinese language. So left hand side, when the sun is shining on a major metropolis or the capital, when the farmers walk near the metro metropolis or they walk near the capital, they see all the buildings where the kings, where the king and the queen and the emperor and the emper empress would, would live in. And they, they would say, wow, the buildings, the grandeur of the city is just wonderful. Especially when all these sites are reflected in the moat of the castle, of the metropolis, of the big city, of the capital. So these three strokes represent the reflections of the beautiful sight of, of the capital or the metropolis. So this character put together, it means reflections or reflection. And the following character is very important. As a noun, it means inside. It means inside. So this character is clothing is the radical. And it shows you every piece of clothing. Once you call it clothes, a piece of clothing has its inner side and it has its outer side. So this character is the Chinese character, Chinese word for inside because every piece of clothing would have its inside. So this character is a noun in Chinese, but in English, yes, it could well be a preposition. So when it goes after the character for reflection, it becomes inside the reflection. The reflection of all the golden blossoms. So class, do you see what's going on grammatically? 
we have adjective now and another adjective and now the inside of shadow shadows inside golden blossom so do you see how nouns being modified must always go last and that's the first phrase when you chant it you have to do it you have to do it this way and then you come down class it wouldn't hurt you if you repeat after me very low very low you see that v like mark above the i that, that shows you it's very low it's the low so we have high high low low and jinghua is high both gold and blossoms they open for everyone to see and gold is as precious as heaven so the chinese people think they're great they represent they are within the masculine force dominated universe so in this four character phrase musically tonally we already have high high followed by low low very good and then let's move on and the, this is the what we just studied is the i would say it's an infinitive phrase is i'm sorry it's a, a a prepositional phrase functioning as an adverb in the reflections of blossoms which are golden so that is what we just studied the main clause come comes next with this three character phrase so the fifth character of this line is chun again chun. You go high because it, this is spring is here spring is here chun the lunar new year to the chinese is the beginning of spring spring is advent so this is spring now what is the character for spring etymologically the bottom is the sun you compare the bottom of chun with the top of the left component of the third character they are the same class do you see this class they are identical the same but what is on the top of the sun in inside the character for spring the fifth character the fifth character once upon a time when it was born you see all the trees are growing in profusion and on the tips of their branches you will see blossoms so the sun is shining on them the trees are basking in the sun spring after a long cold winter is finally here so this is the chinese character for spring spring what spring is a noun and followed by guang another high tone character so we have chun guang like that you see how if you look at me you see how i crane up my head i do chun guang like that 
Now let's check out the character Guang. The top of the Guang, we see three strokes. One vertical, short vertical stroke, sandwiched by two. The left-hand side one is a dot. The right-hand side one is a tick, uh, not tick, a sweep. So these three strokes represent the light, the light upon a torch on the tip, on the tip of a torch. The fire is burning. It brings to mind, it brings to mind the Olympics to carry the torch. So the so to their bot to their bottom, to the bottom, below them, below the three strokes, is the what the candles or whatever they light the torch with. There is a plate. Obviously, it was made of metal on which they put in the ancient times, they put candles or something that would light up on top to serve as the torch, as a torch. And the bottom is someone running and holding the torch. So this character would always call to mind the Olympics. So this is the Chinese character for light. This light is light as in brightness, not as, not as in uh, something, not as in uh, the word for to weigh something, heavy or light. No, it's not. It's for the light is coming in into my room, that kind of light. So spring light, so spring here is a noun that is functioning as an adjective, which means between Chun and Guang, there is another omitted adjectival particle. This is spring light. And the last character of the first line is man. Ah, the radical appears on the left, which consists of three drops of water. The top two drop drops. We can tell clearly these are two drops. They, they even look a little bit like teardrops, two drops. And the third drop hits the ground and it splashes. That's why it goes up. Class, do you see that? So this is water radical, which means the character must have something to do with water. Does it? Yes, it does. So the right hand side put together, all the people are crowded in the room. So mm. what does the last character mean? It means to but, fill up, to saturate. So the last character is to fill up or to saturate. So here we have the last character functions as the main predicate. It's the only verb in this line. Without a verb, a line is not a for is not a sentence. A line of sentence is just a phrase. But this is a this is a sentence. This line. So you put it together. So in the reflections of all the blossoms that seem golden. Spring light saturates the universe. That's the first line in, in uh, literal translation. 
not in free translation. And so below the sounds of these characters, I put down the literal translations of these characters, each of these characters. So I put down gold blossom reflection inside spring light fill. And in English, I'm afraid you must do spring light saturates in the reflections of golden, of the golden blossoms. Something like that. Class, are you with me? Have I explained clearly? Because I well know how alien this is to you. So have I explained clearly? Class, demute yourself and let me let me hear an answer before I move yes. on. Okay. Yes. Yes. So yes. So the first line leaves us in a very confused mind, in confusion. What does it mean, gold, golden blossom? What does it mean, golden petals? What does it mean? Ah, not until the second line does our, does our artist provide us with the answer. From the first two characters, Bao Zhu, this character Zhu, now, nowadays, it's second tone, rising high. But in the ancient times, it was a low tone character, low pitch. Oh, it, so it's very abrupt, it goes down. So like that, not at all as how it is pronounced nowadays. So for anyone who understands the Chinese language, do not think this is Zhu because the computer doesn't know better. The computer does not understand classical Chinese. So it should be for thought. So it's Bao Zhu. So it's low, low. Bao Zhu. The character Bao has, has fire as its radical to the left, the left hand side component of that character is fire. Four dot, four lines, because in the ancient times, when it was created, it was four flames burning. Later on, it went through stages of transformation until finally it became what it looks now. So it's fire radical, which tells you the character must have something to do with fire. So what what what's the right what's the right right hand side component? The right hand side Spine. component. One more time, we see the picture of the sun showing up, making its appearance. Class, do you see that? Do you mm -hmm. see that? Yes. Again, the sun. To the Chinese farmers in the ancient times, the sun is the most important thing, godlike thing. And it can be very hot. It has force, it has power. It can make all the rice plant, it can make rice grow, it can make wheat grow. Its power is limitless, unlimited. So the sun. So when the sun comes out, you see all the hands are saying, wow, the sun is out. <laughs> Everybody must be clap their hands. They will, the, the applause will, will break up, will break up and it will break into a loud sound. Uh, uh, Lin老师, 
Huh? One more, sir. I have lost. Uh, I I cannot see the see see the uh hand up. I see Frank Tang on the screen. Uh, hand up. I'm still here. Uh, but I all I can see is Frank Tang. The name. Oh, wait a minute. No, still there. Now? Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. So this character Ba means a violent sound, a great noise, clamorous, clamorousness, a clamor. This Ba, but it can also be exploding because applause can break into a violent noise. So this is breaking up in a, in a, into a violent, a loud sound, followed by, so that character is the picture of bamboo leaves bamboo leaves so the next second character of the second line is bamboo bamboos ah so this is exploding bamboo what is exploding bamboo in ancient times the chinese people farmers thousands of years ago i don't even know when i tried to find out but i couldn't Thousands of years ago, Chinese people, they realized how sturdy, how strong, how unbreakable bamboo stalks, bamboos are. So with saw, they cut off one section of a bamboo and then they, then they put gunpowder, into that section and to, to cover it with something, something heavy, maybe leather or something. And then they set fire to oh, yeah. the to this. And then the first firecracker was created. So exploding bamboo liter literally means in Chinese firecracker. So of course now the Chinese in the world, when you set off firecrackers, you do not use bamboo anymore. Now you use other things. But in the ancient times, Chinese people did. So bao zhu, the first two characters as a word, as oh. a word <laughs> in Chinese, it means firecrackers. So, but now let's check this. Bao is gold. If when it explodes, when a firecracker breaks open, explodes, what would come out? Sparks of golden stars that suggest golden flower petals or small golden flowers, blossoms. Ah, so that's what the first two characters of the first line as a word, that's what it's referring to. These are just golden sparks flying out of a set firecrackers made of bamboos. That's what it is. But flowers, most of which are pink or red or yellow like daffodils in early spring and bamboo is green. So even in color, do you see they are the same part of speech now? They're both nouns, but the colors are different. And the meaning one is flower, one is bamboo. Yes, they're both plant life or vegetation. And gold and explode. They should be siblings or at least cousin words characters to each other. So Qinghua 
is the perfect match for Bao Zhu. Yet, in music, in tonal scheme, no problem, I knew it. Jin Hua happens to be high tone, and Bao Zhu is low tone. Bao Zhu. The tone, the pitch drops in their attempt to reach the ground. And then Bao Zhu is followed by the character Shang. Then in tone, it goes back to the high tone. Shang. And what do we see in the, this character? The bottom component of this character. The bottom component of Shang of the third character of the second line. The bottom component is a big ear. It's a ear in its most nation, nascent form. It was a picture of a human ear or any ear of, a, of an animal, of a beast. So a big ear radical. And the top is everybody is making sound and nobody can hear the uh, someone's talking or anything, but only the noise will be there. So this song later on became the Chinese character that means sound or noise. And what it's what is it echoing? Now it's echoing the third character in the first line, shadow. Reflection, the match of reflection is sound. Sound is hearing and reflection is seeing. So the first line is seeing and feeling, you feel the spring light comes with the spring light is the warm weather, is warmth. And comes with set firecrackers is the sound. And now look, let's look at the fourth character. The second line is all about the mind, the feelings, the feelings and hearing. So you see how these, how these Chinese, classical Chinese poetic lines, how sensuous, how sensuous, how sensual they are. Two lines would represent feelings and see. They would represent sounds and more feelings of the mind. The first line represents feeling of the body. Second line would show you the feelings of the mind, of the heart. So the fourth character of the second line is in the middle or the middle, the center. Do you see there is a frame? It's right in the middle, there's a horizontal, there's a vertical line that goes through it. It means the middle, or it can be in the middle. <clears throat> so here it is again, like its counterpart in the first line, Li, it happens to be a preposition, which, me which means within or in, in the sound of the bamboos which are cracking, which are exploding. So do you see how the four character phrase in the sec second line would echo structurally perfectly with the four characters, the first phrase in the first line. But as for the tones, the music, 
they are the complete opposite. 抱住, whereas 抱住 are low tones. 声中, the two tones are back to high tones, high high. The opposite of the third and fourth characters of the first line. Followed by the three character phrase, which is the main clause, just like the first line. And the fifth character of the second line happens to be xi, which is happiness. What is the radical, the very bottom of the character? Mouth, human mouth. What is an ideal human mouth? It is to smile. Everybody is laughing and music is playing. The top component consists of many lines. What, what is it? These are drums and musical instruments. So music is playing at a happy time and all the mouths are smiling mouths. Everybody, everyone, everybody is happy. So this is the Chinese character, Chinese word for happy or happiness. So it can be an adjective, it can be a noun. What follows is qi. So class, you may have heard of the sound qi, but it's usually spelled as C-H-I in, in English to represent inner force or energy or physical power, <clears throat> qi. Also, it can be steam or mood or temperament. It can have all these meanings. And this qi, where do you get your energy and inner force? Where do you get your uh, strength? You need to eat rice. So the inside, the bottom component, or by itself, the inside component of the character is rice. <clears throat> and the top component represents lines of air floating. So qi is energy, inner force, <clears throat> strength, power, <clears throat> mood, or temperament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Happy energy, happy inner force. It's echoing. It's a perfect match for the two character fra phrase of the first line. Spring light, the match is happy energy, happy strength, happy mood. And the last character is come. To the Chinese, this character is always really come not the English come, but really always approaching the speaker, that kind of come. You have come. <clears throat> you have come to me. In this case, come to all of us. There is no object. That means come to the all, everyone, everything in the world, in the universe. So whereas in the first line, the spring light has saturated the universe. In the second line, the happy mood, the happy force, heavenly force has come to all of us. And lie is rising tone, high. So class, check out the tonal scheme and the structure. So let's look at what we studied 
at the beginning of our class one more time, and then we come back to these two lines. Class, let's take a quick look at what we what we saw before. We have now, 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 followed by the main clause, now, now, verb. Second line, now, 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 followed by now, now, verb. But three of the four nouns, they have adjectives. And, and the second noun of the main, in the main course, uh, main course, main clause. It also has a omitted adjectival particle. But basically the first line is now, 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 now verb. Second line is that exactly the same, parallelism. This is what parallelism means. Now, 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 now verb. And what about the tonal scheme? Ming uh, roll up a little bit. Yes, thank you. And the first line is high, high, low, low, high, high, low. In Chinese, it's ping, ping, zhe, zhe, ping, ping, zhe. They have to be tonal scheme, is that every syllable must be ant antithetical to its counterpart in the second line. So the second line must be low, low, high, high, low, low, high. In Chinese, it's zhe, zhe, ping, ping, zhe, zhe, ping. Now let's look at the first poetic lines. One more time. We have jin hua ying li, chun guang man, bao zhu sheng zhong, now, last note of the rules governing the composing of these poetic lines. The last character of the last line, of the second line, must always be an elevated tone to show that this couplet will bring you positive, something positive that exists, exists in the masculine force dominated universe. Not too profound, not too profound like the feminine force. Feminine force can be dark, but can be very profound. But when you are composing a, a couplet, the last final character of the second line must be high. So the two lines, grammatic, grammatical arrangement is perfection. So is the, the tonal scheme of the two lines. So this is what we, we call the a spring, the spring couplet written only during the Lunar uh, New Year. Now, class, now let's look at the original to talk about his calligraphy. In my opinion, he is one of the greatest in the history of Chinese culture. Starting over a thousand years ago, Lin Lashi, again, I'm having Frank Tang. Yeah, yes. Okay, first let everybody see the, see the entire thing, class. Do you see that, see it, class? Now you're seeing yes. the, the real McCoy. Yes. Look at the class, even to those who have never been exposed to the study of the Chinese language, how does this strike you? Tell me the truth. Ugly or pleasant or uh, uh, okay, it's okay. Which one? Say beautiful. Really? 
That's because you are you you know Chinese characters. I mean, those who have never been oh. exposed to the Chinese characters before. Mind you, the paper was bright red, but it's yellowing with antiquity. After all, it's been 69 years since this couplet was written, composed and written. So now let's look at every character. Okay, that, that's good. That's good, Lin Look at the first character he did. This, the first stroke, the first stroke. Do you see with what steely will of a poet, of an artist, he executed the first line with such power. He used all his strength and all the power a brush can give to execute the first line and to say, wow, this is so masculine. Can you feel it, class? And then the second line, immediately he comes down to take care of the feminine force. So the two lines, only two first, first two lines of this character, he has established a perfect balance between the yin and yang. The first stroke is yang, second stroke is yin, masculine force and the feminine force. Class, are you with me? Yes. As the top of this character and the rest, this style is, is between running and cursive, xing cai, to show a carefree, celebratory spirit, to show a happy mood. And this was after he had two or three glasses of uh, VSOP, cognac, before he composed this and wrote this. And the second line, the first stroke of the grass radical, he does it lightly as if the, as if the stroke is dancing. And then that tick leads him to the, where the second stroke starts. You see the tick, it goes up to where the second stroke, the, the stroke next to it starts. And then after this light and like dancing frivolous stroke, again, he gives a counterpart, the masculine force of this, of another stroke, which is actually when, when printed, what you saw before, don't you think, don't you think what we saw before, all of a sudden, all of a sudden the characters turn very, very boring because you have this to show you the thin, the thinness and the thickness of these strokes to represent his mood. So the second, the same type of stroke, which I call sweep. And, but he executes the two lines quite differently. Again, he's thinking about the a perfect balance before, between the yin and yang. And he continues on to write this character. And he, then he creates another stroke, one stroke continuous stroke to show mascul masculinity before he executes the small vertical stroke with a tick. That is the feminine force. The next stroke, xiao shu, 
刘老师，下花的左边的下边一对。So he gives it a little tick, very soft again,、okay. like dance mo motion tick, in order for his hand to get to that very heavy dot stroke on the far left of the of the component, far left. Ah,、uh, far right. I'm sorry. Far right. Yes, to this stroke. Again, he used power and strength. He put his brush down, and the, that little tick brings him to the final stroke. He, and he does a very soft, very soft line, as when a beauty, when a beauty. When a lady, a gentle, soft, and beautiful lady is lying down, softly. Class, this is what I call calligraphic glory. As how it's expressed, fully manifested in the first two characters that he created, let alone the coming ones. And in the third characters, it's, it's the same. He combines all the strokes with、uh, feminine force, and he blends, he balances all the strokes perfectly with masculine force and feminine force <clears throat> to express him as an artist. He's always walking a delicate and thin line between the two forces, and only when the when this combination, this blending is observed, then beauty can emerge. Beauty can generate from this perfection of. Perfect, perfect blending, perfection of a union between the two forces. And in the following, in the following character, Li, Ling 老师 let's move down a little bit. The character Li. Now you understand. You look at the heavy strokes and the thin strokes class. Do you see that? He、yes. always starts with heavy. And he ends with heavy, but in between, a lot of feminine force, a lot of tenderness. A lot of tenderness, and the now next stroke is Chun Spring. Spring is here with a force. With a burst of energy, represent re represented in that long, slightly curved stroke, which is completely parallel to the first stroke in that first character. Maybe the thickness is different, but they are parallel. Class, if you look back. To the first character, you see, you see, you see how they parallel, class. And look at how he ends this, because above he has so many feminine,、uh, masculine forces, forced dominated strokes, and the, the end. And the sun is saying, "Wow, you have bloomed so beautifully." All the trees, I admire you, you know. I admire you. So the sun is not as powerful as all these flowers and trees. And this, the one, two, three, the four, five, the fifth stroke, is what I call a genius stroke. Yeah. Because that stroke is supposed to be coming down, but he goes up. And he does that with a genius. 
And this is his signature mark. Class, I fashioned my writing style after him, thinking that I could for about 20 years, thinking absurdly that I could su succeed one day. But few days, a few days ago, when I took the, the couplet out, I realized that my characters totally suck compared to his. And I just, I decided to give up but I, because I could never be like him. So next character, he, because he has already done too much of the balance. So in the next character, he does a little bit of the masculine force with two strokes, the first stroke and the third stroke. A little higher, a little stronger. And the rest, it's very light because after all, he is, he is writing the character for light. Let me ask you, even in English, why does light as in weight, the same as in light, as in the light for, for the light in weight? How come they're the same? In Chinese, they are connected. That's yeah. why when he's writing the character light, he gives it the entire character a light tone. Class, do you agree? Can you see that? Yes. yes. Then he comes to the last character and he goes back to that heavy man. The water radical is connected all three strokes connected, but with what power he does the radical. And the, as for the right hand side component, he 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 takes it easy. But the, the last stroke is heavy at, because it's again to answer, to echo the first stroke on the left. And it's the end of the first line. It's very heavy down. It's, he, he starts with a very stroke push, pushing down. He executed that line. And because do you see the final, the bottom character, the bottom component of the right-hand side that underneath, it's, there's something wrapping. Do you see that? Something within an area. So with a pen, he is wrapping this character. Class, he is wrapping because he is created to say saturates. It's filling. The spring light is, has gone to every corner in the whole entire world. So his writing Tells, tells us he is his genius. So now let's look at the second line. The way he writes this, this character means explode. So he imbues a lot of ma masculine force into the writing. And the second writing, bamboo, Bamboos are trees, but still they are, they would wave, they're seemingly soft. They would wave in the breeze. So it's, but they're very sturdy and Chinese people love it. It's one of the most beloved, beloved trees by the Chinese. So he is mixing, but still, he does these thin strokes, class, have you noticed? And the last stroke, there's a little curve as if this, this line is saying, I need to rest a little bit here. <laughs> and moving down is the same thing. It's a complete, ideal, perfect mixture, blending of the feminine and the 
masculine forces. And we move down, please, the last shit. And yeah. And every character, he does the same thing. Until, until he gets to Qi. Now, this Guang is light, but Qi, he is almost, he's almost, he, stuck, he sticks with this force. Even though at the beginning of the, of, of the line, of the top line, he starts thin, but then he puts a lot of energy and force into the writing of this. Can you feel? And then the last, final character, someone, something, what? The happy energy, happy force. Ling Lao we move up a little bit. Yes. Now let's look at the final three, the strokes of Lai. Wow, that dot. He turned a left to right sweep into a heavy dock to say, I'm done because the happy force, happy mood that heaven has expressed for us. His good message, his good wishes, heaven's good wishes are upon every single one of us. Yes, it's here. Class, now do you see the beauty of, of his? So as I was thinking, uh, looking at him, what comes into mind is what Alexander Pope, 18th century, the great 18th century poet from England, he said this, he urged us, Pope, urged us, all people of all generations, of all time, to wake the soul by tender strokes of art, to raise the genius and to mend the heart. Class, please turn off whatever you have on because I have arrived, I've reached my finale. I want you to hear what I have to say, please. He said, to wake the soul by tender strokes of art, to raise the genius and to mend the heart. Isn't he talking about Puru? What Puru is showing us, Alexander, is telling us. And another great poet of sixth century from Greece, Simonides, he tells us, he tells us, painting is silent poetry. Poetry, painting that sings. Ah, both Western masters tell us something about the Chinese language and its sounds, its structure, its, its structure in pictures. They come from pictures and they have music with it. So for me, it's a bless sitting here during New Year's time to talk about this. I feel so close to this master in spirit. I hope you are too. Thank you so much. Now it's Q and A time. I and I, I'm humbly asking Shen Zhan to take over. Thank you for coming, and I am very happy to see you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wang Thank you, Wang Lao Shi. It's just wonderful. What a what a learning experience. Thanks. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I am in fact speechless. It's hard to follow Wang Lao Shi. 
especially after uh, or your lecture and ending the the two poets from the Western culture, it really tells well how cultures, sentiments, and feelings can be transformed in different exactly. forms of art. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We are brethren, East and West. So the saying East is East, West is West, West is all wrong. East and West, brethren, we are. Exactly. And so, when you... Jai, I want you to handle the uh, take uh, handle the uh, Q and A. Of course, yeah. So now uh, the floor is open, and if you have any questions, please you can either type in the <clears throat> chat room, or you can unmute yourself and speak. I know in the audience there are some students of Wang Laoshi from his various classes. And there are also teachers teaching Chinese language or maybe teaching something about China. Or there would be just audience who are interested in Chinese poems, couplets, and culture in general. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to, we have only uh, less than 15 minutes for, for the night. <laughs> no questions. Zhenzhen, if I might, I saw, uh, this is Robin and I saw a question in the chat. Yes, Robin. It says, Professor Wang, please suggest the best references I should look for to learn calligraphy and the Chinese language with the etymology of characters. As a French Canadian linguist, this evening was an amazing eye opener for me. Now I understand with you. Other lecturers only explained technical strokes, but you give life to the characters so well with emotions. What references would you suggest to start learning the Chinese language system with the etymology of characters and their calligraphy? Ben Wang. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. In my arrogance, you know, yeah. But, well, I must tell you, I spent many years after I turned 40. I spent maybe around 20 years. Now I'm still studying. I'm, I made a point of, of uh, studying or, and learning uh, 10 characters every day for about six or seven years. Yeah, every night I spend maybe four hours. That's how I, because I was, I had never been taught when, when I was small. So, but I got very interested in it. And when I apply uh, etymology, uh, when, I, when, I, when I taught students here in America, I, the first time I still remember how excited they were, you know, so I said, why don't I just do more? But since I didn't know, so I had to do it. But I need to tell you something. I hope it's, it doesn't uh, disappoint you too much. That's what I'm, what, not what I'm trying to do. Because if you read, I can recommend book, books of etymology. But when you read them, most of them are very boring, dry and boring and very, very um, stuffy, you know, because when I teach, because, because of my age, I'm a very old person, you know, I can be your granddad, maybe great granddad. So, because I have, I lived the first uh, 30, uh, 20 years, 15, at least 15 years of my being in America, in the United States, I, uh, led a very decadent life, you know, which allowed me to be not just decadent, but I learned a lot of things about life, you know, like, you know, I, I won't go into getting into details, but it helps me now because when I explain etymology, I base everything I talk on the, on, 
on what was written by the masters thousands of years ago. But I threw in, I put in my own life experience and I create, I try to create a, little, a world more interesting, more sensual or sensuous, sensuous world for students to enjoy, to remember the character. Ultimately, that is the purpose, you know. And, but of course, you cannot get away from the components that are in the characters. If the <clears throat> components, such as the one we saw, like flower, it consists of plants, plant, and transformation. You have to work within these two words, two concepts, you know, but you can give, you can throw in your, your you can incorporate into this basic concept, your own life experience, your own emotion, emotions, your own happiness and sorrows, you know, all that. So I can imagine, I can recommend a, a, a etymology book, which is by Shenzhen, help me here, by Cecilia, you know, that person? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, actually, Anthony, Anthony put in the chat box the name of the book by Cecilia Lindquist. Lindquist, yeah. yes. That yeah. Is, Empire of Living Symbols. Thank yeah. you, Anthony. That is one and one only uh, book on etymology that I personally loved. So over the years, I have bought more than 50 copies to give away. To give to my to my favorite students because I I really wow. admire the the the, the writer the editor. Yeah. Well, there, so, there are, oh, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You can get oh. it on Amazon. Uh, Robin. Yeah. So. It's, it's available on Amazon and you can yes. see the title of the book in the chat box. Uh, there are many comments in the chat box while, uh, while about how educational, um, revealing and insightful this lecture is. There is a question from Diane. What are the characters along the right side of the right panel of the couplet? So this is oh. more concrete. And so, I, I think it is to understand yeah, the thing. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So the right hand side is to tie two things together with silk. So maybe Lin Lao Shi can bring the couplets back. We can see the traditional the character. Traditional character. The right the right hand side component, the top, is consists of two pieces of silk. No, Xia Qiang, he asked me what the left side of the left side is. Oh. Wait, hold on. You will write the same thing? Wait, OK. Let me, let me read the question again. What are the characters along the right side of the right panel of the couplet? It's I think it is the right it, it is it's on the right shoulder of the first line of the panel oh uh, in, in the in the couplet uh class i forgot to tell you in the classical chinese the lines go from right to left okay which character are you talking about me oh uh, are these these yes. are the small, the small character. Yes, these six are the characters. Yes, ben. yes. It, yes. It, it says Those dedication, six. dedication to Master Bao Xuan, oh. that which is the name of my father. Mm. Bao Xuan Xian Shang Zhi Shu. Six mm. characters, literally. Mm. Mm. Master oh. Bao Xuan's belonging, meaning. Mm. I have composed this and this will belong to you. To you. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is the, the
the Chinese way of writing a line of dedication. And my father's name was Bao Xuan. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And, and in, the, in the left hand is Master. Zhi Shu. Zhi is that is that omitted modification carrier particle, meaning it's a belonging of Master Baxia. So literal translation is this piece of work is the belonging of Master Baxia, which is the Chinese way of uh, putting down dedication. And so his, we are, his signature? The signature is, is to the left, to the right. left of the second line here. Xin Yu. That's his sobriquet, his literary sobriquet for himself, which literally means it's a very unusual character, the last character. Xin Yu. The character is, I would do it myself. And the first character is heart. My heart will be handled and maneuvered by myself. That's the meaning of his sobriquet, Xin Yu. Thank you. And you see the two, two seals that he put down. It, the paper is so yellowing with antiquity the seals, the lines have all but melted. I cannot figure out anymore. But I know oh. both are bear his name, Puru Puru. Oh. So this one is that this couplet is the most loved and treasured and dearest to my heart uh, treasure of mine. Wherever, wherever I go, I will, I'll bring this. Mm -hmm. Do you good. see the, do you see the right hand side of the first, for, first line? The first, the first frame to the right in the middle, because in Taiwan, it's so humid. So when I, when my, when my parents told me to, to bring it to New York, at that time it had already been molded. Do you see that? Yes. Thank God it did not affect the characters at all. <laughs> I've had it for, for uh, about 40, 45 years. Thank you, Wang Laoshi. We ah, are- So no more questions? Well, there is one more question perhaps where well, you can give a quick answer uh, as, as for us to have some fruitful thoughts okay. after this program. Okay. Besides your beloved Puru's couplet, can you give another example of classical couplet or maybe oh. poem that you admire? Oh my God, so many. <laughs> Actually, I have but, a question too. But none as, as loved as this one. None, none. This is, this is the one I read, I love the best. Yeah. Hi, dear. How, how are you? Uh, are we, huh? Yeah, Ma Michael, no. Uh, uh, Minchi. So I am absolutely um, uh, moved by, uh, thank you very much for uh, helping me understand the correspondence between 
the character groups from one line to the other, which yes. I hadn't quite realized. So Qinhua corresponds to Bao Zhu, and mm. then Ying corresponds to Sheng. And I, I'm really- Exactly, really exactly, and, the and matching then, game. So, yeah. and it's different senses. It's a matter, oh, uh, Ying, it's a matter of a sense. And so is Sheng, just exactly, different one. Exactly, so exactly, exactly. I'm totally moved by this. Um, my question is this. I understand that, of course, it's seven characters and then again, seven characters. Right. But also, uh, there are two groups, four plus three, four plus three. Is this representative right. of couplets or are couplets separated into different number of syllables? No, couplets can be, can be quadrosyllabic, could be <clears throat> pentasyllabic, Heptasyllabic is the most beloved one, most loved one. Uh, heptasyllabic, <laughs> that's yeah. what we but, just studied. But when you but, have, yeah, sorry. But also there are two lines, six characters per line. But so I, have not, I, I have seen at funeral uh, service, I have seen couplets with nine characters or even 10. But nowadays, you know, with the with the increase of time, all this classical stuff is not so respected anymore. So, if you on the mainland, if you go to a, a cele celebration or a funeral service, you will see the language in colloquial Chinese, which is unendurable to me. You know, I I cannot stand it. Not everyone does that, and even though they try classical ones, but they're just so silly. <clears throat> so when I say they are large, they're all old. They're all uh, very long ago, like centuries ago. So this was written 69 years ago. But during his lifetime, Puro, no one, no artist could surpass him. He, because he was unsurpassed in poetry, calligraphy, and painting. That makes him absolutely, hands down, the greatest. And so does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yes, it does. And also, I hope that you do another Zoom lecture in which you discuss <laughs> not only a couplet, but also a painting that goes with a couplet. <laughs> I very much hope you do okay. that for everybody's uh, uh, happiness. Yeah. Guys, if you like me, you have, to, you have to do a little begging to my boss, Shen Zhan. <laughs> okay. I, I, I am in charge, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and you Speaking might, of which, Wang you, Lashi, you might beg a little bit to <laughs> Professor Tang because Professor Tang is a close partner of Shen Zhan, my boss. Okay. <laughs> and the Robin too. <laughs> exactly. Well, well. Speaking of which, um, well, one thing is, well, Wang Lashi is teaching etymology, which is integrating Chinese characters and many other cultural artistic elements into his courses uh, this semester and next semester. And also for all of today's learning, um, especially I'm thinking for, for teachers who are teaching young students, how these profound understanding of Chinese poetry and couplets can be brought into um, classrooms to teach students at a young age how to have fun. Perhaps that would deserve another <laughs> program. I'm looking at Tang Lao Shi and Robin, and we can we can discuss how we can um, think about something in the future. But for today, thanks Wang Lao Shi very much for this um, insightful and inspiring lecture and discussions with all the participants. Thank you so much for coming. And of course, well, thanks Tang Lao Shi and Robin and all the teachers joining us. I also want to particularly thank Lin Lao Shi, Lin Yongqiang, Lin Lao Shi so behind the scene. So uh, very busy, all the marks, all the switching of the slides and making sure everybody can see what Wang Lao Shi is pointing at. 
Um, thanks, Linash, very much. Also, so, uh, Linash yeah. has posted the CTLE survey in the chat box if you are a New York State teacher uh, looking for receiving the certificate for the two hour CTLE credits, please click that link and complete the survey. That's the only way we will be able to send the certificate to you.